Hi, everybody. My name is Taylor Jackson Ross, and I am with Chase What Flies, and I'm here to talk to you about the beginning of Richard II. Richard II is up. It is on. Get your tickets now. We run through Sunday, December 3rd. Don't miss it. We have links for tickets, our Facebook page, and our Indiegogo in case you'd like to donate. The links are somewhere. Someone will attach them, I assume. I hope. Right, so the beginning of this play happens very quickly, and they talk about things that happened in the past that aren't happening on stage, and sometimes it's confusing. So whether you are a true Shakespeare nerd, or if you kind of hate this stuff, like my mom. <laughs> she loves me very much. We want you to have a good time and to know what's going on, so I'm gonna walk you through it. So come on over here, we've got a little bit of a genealogy. Don't be frightened, I'll make it simple. So, if I was gonna to talk to you about Abraham Lincoln, I'm writing a play, right, and I start listing off people like John Wilkes Booth, Ulysses S. Grant, Harriet Tubman, we kind of know, as Americans, who those people are, we know what's going on. The same thing was happening for Shakespeare's audience with Richard II. They kind of knew the backstory. We don't really have that here in America in this era, so I'm gonna walk you through it so you've got an idea of what's happening at the top of the show. We're gonna start with King Edward III. He is the King of England in sort of the 1300s. Uh, he reigns for a long time. He is very cool. He does a lot of good stuff. He's a good king and people dig him, you know. Uh, and he has many children, more than you see listed here, and most of them survive, which is unusual, and a lot of them are men, which is important later. So the rule at the time is if you're king, your first son is going to be king, and then his first son is going to be king. All these people are technically in line for the throne, but unless a bunch of people die, they're never going to make it there. Uh, so Edward's first son is Edward, confusing. And then he has baby Richard, who's going to be King Richard. But something happens here. The reason Edward the Black Prince is called the Black Prince is because he never actually makes it to the throne. He dies, sort of in, you know, the, the early stages. So his father's still king. This thing is a baby over here, and he's dead. But all these people don't count because Richard is alive. So. When King Edward III dies, it goes straight to Richard, who is crowned King of England, anointed by God at 10 years old. Now, of course, he is a child. You can't have a child through the country. So, his uncles are there to help him. They serve as sort of regents, as advisors, all of this stuff. So they're helping little baby King Richard make decisions for a country. Now, as you know, when family and politics get together, it's messy. Most of you are not even going to survive the holidays, I'm guessing. Just try to imagine running the country with the people that you're related to. Ugh! So, that becomes kind of a problem when Richard grows up and is an adult. He has surrounded himself with some foolish people, and together they are spending most of the country's money on silly things, like lavish parties and stuff that Richard and his friends like, and bribery. Uh, no one is happy with them. They're getting taxed like crazy, including the nobles, and it doesn't seem to be doing anything for the country at large. So, Richard is up against his remaining uncles, and they keep resting sort of for power back and forth. Richard is getting really frustrated, and these guys are getting older, and they can't control him anymore. Then something happens, and this is something they're going to reference throughout the play. The Duke of Gloucester, one of Richard's uncles, is murdered. He is murdered in his bed at the house of Thomas Mowbray, one of Richard's dearest childhood friends. And everybody kind of knows it's an open secret that Richard probably had something to do with it. Even historically, it's kind of known. It's never really been proven, but there's a lot pointing to the idea that he had this set up. No one talks about it, though, except for a year later, at the top of this play, Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of Hereford, decides to accuse somebody. He comes and he accuses Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, and he says, you have murdered the Duke of Gloucester. And the unsaid thing in the room is, if we're gonna accuse Norfolk, we're actually accusing Richard. And it is deeply uncomfortable. Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of Hereford, he's got a million names, just deal with it, uh, is charismatic. He is an excellent leader. He would make a wonderful king, but the problem is, He's not in line right now. Richard is king, and in those days, whoever was king, they're chosen by God. If you go against the king, you are going against God. So the things that happened in the play start to take on a cosmic level of importance, and 
that, my friends, is the beginning of this play.